in the riches of divine grace. A wonderful provision has been made for every one of God's precious children. A provision has been made for constant, unbroken victory on the part of every child of God. A victory that's unaffected, absolutely unaffected by circumstances, however adverse, however depressing these circumstances may be, provision has been made by God for every one of his children for literally an unbroken victory, an unbroken fellowship. The gift in large measure is unaccepted, partly because of ignorance as to its nature and value, and also on the ground of its terms, and its terms require a surrender which the average Christian is unwilling to make, a surrender that the average Christian is unwilling to yield. You see, uh, things gotten cheap are usually cheap, you know. <laughs> the things that you have to pay most for are usually the things that are most valuable and that we appreciate most. It's kind of like that. And the most extraordinary thing about the victorious life is that although it's so clearly taught in this picture, yet it is so frequently unrecognized by Bible students. That's something that's been very difficult for me to understand. Why it is that so many men in our pulpits today, so many of our seminary students, so many, many of our spiritual leaders have not recognized this wonderful life of unbroken victory with the Lord Jesus Christ. Many who have a thorough knowledge of the Bibles know nothing of this truth experimentally. And you cannot give to someone else. No minister can give to members of this congregation more than he has experienced himself. And I do hope that there are many ministers of the gospel following me in these heart-to-heart -heart talks not to be cause of me, not because I'm giving them, but because they are based on the very Word of God. And if you can catch the glory of the truth that I've been trying to give to you, then you can go into your pulpits and give to your people something that will revolutionize, will change their entire spiritual life. It will change you as a minister. I mean exactly that. It's been one of the greatest truths that it has been my privilege to receive from the Master. How is it that we're so slow of heart to understand? Probably the best way to put the case is to describe at some length the inner experiences of two men who had long been devoted to the service of God. Born again, I would not question the fact that they had never been born again. If you have read regarding the lies of these men, you would readily agree with me. They were God's precious children. Oh, sure. They were devoted to the service of God. Take, for instance, Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China, was one of these men. He's left a letter 
And the letter was written to his sister. A record of his search for holiness. His search for a deeper walk with God. A constant abiding in Christ Jesus. And in his letter, he tells of his total inability to see how to get it, how to obtain it. Although the way lies so clearly on the pages of the scripture, you cannot help seeing this wonderful truth as you read the word of God. And yet I suppose only the Holy Spirit can make it real to the hearts of men and women. And so, in this letter, written to his sister, Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China, expressed the deep feeling, his great search for this experience that I've been talking about in his heart-to-heart talks. I quote from the letter, I prayed, fasted, agonized, made resolutions, read the Bible more diligently, sought more time for retirement and meditation, but all without effect. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. Then came the question. Is there no rescue? Must it be this to the end? Constant conflict instead of victory? Too often defeat? I hated myself, I hated my sin, and yet I gained no strength against it. I felt I was a child of God. I knew I was a child of God. But how to rise to my privileges as a child, I was utterly powerless to see. I thought that holiness, practical holiness, was to be gradually attained by a diligent use of the means of grace. I felt there was nothing I so much desired in this world, nothing so much I needed. And when my agony of soul was at its very height, a sentencing a letter was used to remove the scales from my eyes. And the Spirit of God revealed the truth of our oneness with Jesus. And do you want to know? Do you desire, even as I desired one day, to know what was in that letter? What was that sentence? Just one sentence that gave to him that which he had sought so long. <laughs> All right, I continue. Oh, this is thrilling. This is priceless. I read from the letter. By faith, a channel is formed by which Christ's fullness plenteously flows down. The barren branch becomes a portion of the fruitful vine. He is most holy who has most of Christ within. Let me repeat that one sentence. It's profound. If you forget everything else, that this letter includes, if you do not hear another word that I may say in this heart-to-heart talk, remember this one sentence. He is most holy who has most of Christ within. It is defective faith which clogs the feet and causes many a fall. Abide. Not struggling or striving. It's looking to Him. It's trusting Him for present power. 